Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. These shows are brought to you by the Compassionate Friends as well as the Open to Hope Foundation. The reason we, Heidi and I do these shows is to really bring hope and healing to those of you who suffered a loss. We love to bring upbeat people, don't we, Heidi? We do, Mama. We have some fabulous guests today, and we know them well, and we've had them on the show before, and we also have a wonderful song and singer-songwriter joining us, too. Fantastic. So, uh, I know you're yeah. really going to enjoy the show today. And if Heidi and I had one request of you all, if you could just tell one or two friends who've had a loss, any mm -hmm. type of loss, about this show, you'd be doing them a great service, and about going to our site, opentohope.com, for hope and support. Absolutely, Mom, and I think it's really important because we're a show that's not about loss, we're about hope. Absolutely. And our guests today have both had sons that died when they were teenagers, mm -hmm. and they have found hope, and they are very positive guys, and they live their life with joy, and they live their life in tribute of their sons. Mm -hmm. So, Mom, we are going to interview today Ron Villano. Mm -hmm. We've had him on the show before. He's written a, an amazing book called The Zing. Ron is a psychotherapist and he works all over New York. He has a staff and his son Michael died in a tractor trailer accident at 17. And then we have R. Glenn Kelly, also known as Ron. Um, he has written a couple of books, Sometimes I Cry in the Shower mm -hmm. and The Grief Case. He and both Ron speak all over the place. They're, they're keynote speakers and they're workshop presenters. And his son Jonathan died of a congenital heart uh, disease and heart failure, and like I said, they're both very dynamic, and they're both very positive, and they speak as men that have been there and that have found their way from the darkness back into the light. And then we are gonna have an incredible um, award-winning singer-songwriter, Anna Huckabee Tull, and she has written Living the Deeper Yes. She is a life coach, and she is gonna sing the song Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes. She commissioned songs for people, Mom. Absolutely. And fantastic. she commissioned a song for a man that's daughter was dying and that died. Wow. Sounds so, like a really power yeah. packed show today. It will be. Well, hey, glad to meet you. See you all on the show today. Ron Volano, so great to see you on today. Thank you. And Arlen Kelly, My and I can't pleasure. reach you, Anna. Hi, <laughs> Ron, Ron, and Anna. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Oh, it's so fabulous. You know, there's so many men. I think you guys know. How long has it been for you? I lost Michael July 22nd, 1998. Uh -huh. yeah, mine was only 2013, so I'm going into my fifth year now. Okay. You know, so many guys don't want to talk about it. Yep. I mean, I mean, I'm saying that. Maybe you guys are guys and are finding this whole world of guys who are willing to talk about grief and loss. But when Heidi and I go, go to Compassionate Friends, we look around the room and we see, well, what do you say, 80% women? 70 or 80% women. And the other 20% are there to support her, right? Yes. Isn't that what you hear? Yeah, yes. I'm just here to support her. Absolutely, Lauren, yes. We have seen an upswing, though, and we've attended the, the two last Compassionate Friends together, and I noticed an upswing there, and I noticed an upswing at the, the conference for bereaved parents in the USA of men that are in attendance, and, and I'm encouraged. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because of some of I what was, Ron and Ron and I do. I think so. I think seeing both of you out there presenting to the world, educating the world, and talking about this, lets other men know it's okay. Mm -hmm. We can be there, we're, we're part of this. This is our loss too, I don't know. What is your thought, Ron Valano? Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, yeah. when I lost my son Michael, I said he took my life. Yeah. Now I say he gave me life. I love it, he, I took my life. I mean, how many people out there are thinking it's your first year, yeah. you took my life? Yeah, yeah. You know? T just took it, you know, and, and now I say he gave me life. Now yeah. everything I do, I live in the moment. I learned how to live in it now. It took a long time, mm -hmm. you know, between let go and let God, mm -hmm. it's a long road. You know, it sounds easy, but it's a long road. But if, if you want to do it, you could get there. Mm -hmm. I live life now every day probably more excited, more joy than I ever had. Wow. And I credit that to Michael. Uh -huh. But I lived very miserably for many years to get to here. Mm -hmm. So, and now the opposite side is, but I, I attest that to how I, much I was in love with my son. So he mm -hmm. taught me what it was to be in love. So I knew what it was to be in love unconditionally. Mm -hmm. So because that love was so deep, the hurt was just as deep on the other side. Right. And then I learned through all of that to get to this point and evolve to here. So I live in the moment. Like mm -hmm. I'm not here today to promote me in any which way. I'm here to promote to other people who, that one person sitting in, in one spot in their house, they can't get out like yeah. I was depressed. You didn't want to live, you want to die. You know, it doesn't matter who's around you. That's the person I hope that I could be a vessel to touch. That one person in there says, wait a minute, 
maybe there is a little light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And then with help from somebody like Ron and some music, and we're a team. Yeah, There's no way like anyone that. could say that they did it, you know? Yeah. So. How about you, Ron? What's your thought on that? You've got one aspect that Ron doesn't have, and that's you had an only child. Though. I did. I did. And, you know, a little deeper aspect to that, too, and, and not many people know this. One of the reasons why uh, things were kind of odd for me is because the day Jonathan was born, they said he wasn't going to make it through the night on his first day. Uh -huh. As you said, he had a congenital heart defect. Yeah. In a rare one, where normally they, they give up on a child when he's born with that condition. But a miraculous mm -hmm. surgeon just jumped in, did some experimental surgeries, and gave him what should have been a prognosis for a full life. Mm -hmm. That's why it was, it was tragic to lose him. But I had to witness him become a hero. I had to witness him because, uh, become somebody who, throughout his life, he loved life. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he shouldn't have been here. Mm -hmm. uh, he, went through, he went through a lot of medical research because of that rare condition, where, where he just avowed himself to be studied and all of his records and all the experimental surgeries. He had a very special life just being here in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when he left, he left me with that, that despondent feeling at first until it hit me too. And the, the good thing that we have now, the other point on that is the fact that what I'm seeing in men is we're starting to realize in men, you know what, I might be this way. There might be a certain way that I am as a man, but guess what, I'm supposed to be this way. Right. And I'm gonna stand up and tell people that, that it's okay to be who we are. The book, Sometimes I Cry in the Shower, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to pimp mm -hmm. the book, but that, <laughs> in, in, that's okay. We can pimp the zing and we can yeah, yeah, We're so happy to have you guys do it. We want, we Showing want it on the screen. In the yeah. book, I say, don't change who you are. This is who I was, yeah. and this is who I accepted to be, and I'm not trying to change myself. Right. And that's the way we have to, to come through this, realizing that we are who we are. Well, I, I like that idea because we, we wrote a book also called Real Men Do Cry with an NFL quarterback of 10 years, Eric mm -hmm. Kipple. He was for the, you were with the Detroit Lions, and his son died by suicide right. as a teenager. And he said part of the issue is, and I know you guys will speak to this, is the messages that boys are given growing up. Mm -hmm. Big boys don't cry, walk it off, suck it up, mm -hmm. be a man, all those things. And it's like, so he's like, you know, we're giving all these messages, and yet it's, it's normal and okay and courageous to be to show emotion sure. mm -hmm. and to fall apart sometimes and to cry in the shower. And I think there's two parts to that. There's nature and nurture. Yeah. I, I, I'll contend in you know, the discussions I've had with people. I think there are things that are buried in our DNA, both male and female, mm -hmm. in, in the sex, that, that drive us to, to do some of the things that we do. Yeah. So. You know, you mentioned uh, community, the compassionate friends, mm -hmm. a little bit. And I just want to, uh, I heard you say before we started the show about Alive Alone. And for people who are watching this show mm -hmm. that are, don't have any other children, right. um, could you tell them just quickly sure. about uh, that? Sure. Alive Alone is just a wonderful nonprofit organization out there, bereavement support organization for parents that have lost their children but have no survive and grandparents that have no surviving children left at home. You know what I love is that you say that they have no surviving children mm -hmm. because they're always parents. Yes. People don't get that. Mm -hmm. You know, they think, oh, they don't have any kids anymore. You know, mm -hmm. but they, they're their kids. Sure. Right. And I did, uh, I had the blessings to do the uh, the keynote speech at the uh, Bereaved Parents of the USA mm -hmm. uh, conference this time. And, and Ron's done best, it there too. Yeah, good. Yeah. But yeah. One, of the, one of the best uh, responses I got is when I stood up and said, you know, I went through all this and I thought through all this and the very one thing that I came out of I said, I am the father of Jonathan Taylor Kelly. Oh, I like and, that. And everybody stood up and applauded that. Mm -hmm. Ron, I like that. And that's important for people to hear. Because mm -hmm. yep. I had lost my identity. I thought I had lost my yeah. identity at one point. So when I was able to say that the one identity I brought back before I brought back any other identity says, I am the father of Jonathan Kelly. And it took you a while, and it's exciting when it hits. Sure. Well, one thing that happens, especially for a man, is the fact that, in my case, because he was my only child, I, I relished in being his father. I mean, I, my identity was wrapped around being the, 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 the father of this marvelous, wonderful miracle child because right. doctors glommed on him, yeah. and, and all the other kids and parents really loved John. He was a hero kid, and he was gone. Yep. Right. You know, I had been, and we talked, I'd been a cop, I'd been a Marine. There were so many identities mm -hmm. that I had in my life that I could have gone back and said, okay, this is who I am. But I voluntarily left all that behind, but I did not want to leave fatherhood behind, ever. But when he was gone, I actually sat back and went, am I still a father? Right, yeah. that's big. And a lot of us go through that. Am I still a parent? Right. If, if Alive alone, if you're left with no surviving Great. children. Now. Thank you. Ron, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you've got on to do because I'm like, blown away you, when I knew you a while ago you've got all these therapy practices all over the yeah, metropolitan yeah. area yeah. talk a little bit about that well, you went from somebody in bed 
And remember, he sat. On, he used yeah. to sit in the. Tree, he used to sit under the tree in his, the front of his house in a chair all day. Yeah, yeah. in a chair all day. I remember for that. about a year. Yeah, for about a year. Yeah. <laughs> and how many how many things have you got going? Well, we have five locations, um, you know, in New York, and we have uh, multiple therapists that work with all different disciplines, and a very strong administrative staff. We take same day appointments, but we work with everything: grieving, you know, obsessive compulsive depression, mm -hmm. and you name it. But we're also connected with psychiatry and you know, nurse practitioners, clinical psychology. So we work with the whole thing. So we're there to get the optimal health for the person. So mm -hmm. if we can't do it, that's our real motto. If we really can't do it, don't do it just to do it. So you gotta send them to the person that really can get them forward in the counseling. Because as a counselor, we mm -hmm. know our goal is to get these people to keep moving forward, yeah, whatever right. it takes. I'll stand on my head, whatever I have to do to get someone just to smile, you know, because there's so many ways to grieve, you know, whether divorce is mm -hmm. going on, whether somebody lost their job, whether someone lost their pet. The people lost a pet, that pet was their child. Right because they couldn't have children. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different ways. But to speak also with what, what Ron was saying a little bit, as someone who lost a son who has three other children, I know a lot of people like myself didn't pay attention to the other three children. Mm -hmm. So they actually suffered based on that the focus was on Michael. Everything was about Michael. Right. Until my daughter one day, she was about seven years old, eight years old, sitting in a couch and looked over and I was talking about Michael to someone on the phone and she said, Wait a minute, we love Michael, but I just want you to know you have other children. Who do we call so, the forgotten grievance yeah. 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 the siblings? Mm -hmm. yeah. So she threw that in there. So, you know, so from that point I started realizing, wait a minute, I gotta pay attention and make Michael part of the family, right. not make him up here because it's gonna How far down the around. road was that? That was about, maybe about six years down, six, mm -hmm. seven years into it because I mean, I was so depressed for years, it was crazy. Yeah. But also as, a, as, as men, I believe most of this stuff reason why men don't grieve like women do. I've, I, the good news is I believe it's based on learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So if it's learned behavior, it could be unlearned and new behaviors can be learned, which is I think where we are. And a lot of men can follow that. Once you think it's solidified, it's like, oh wow, I'm the alpha, this is, I'm, I'm made for this. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think a lot of men, not all, but a lot of men were made into that. They, they believed all these things that they were told. Right. And that's what gives low self-esteem and yeah. a lot of other things in life. So to me, I always feel I was blessed with a mother that never taught me any of that. I was the mama's boy, and I'm open about it. So I learned a lot <laughs> from my mother, you know, like just be non-discriminatory, feel, mm -hmm. cry if you want, all mm -hmm. these other things. So I would always joke, I'm not really the man's man, and a lot of men that I meet will say, no, you're more of it because you can do that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be able to do that, you know. So it's a nice, it's a nice feeling, you know. So, so it's something so, maybe men out there listening know as that. As far as as far as finding hope again, what is what is a piece of advice or information you would give to the guys out there, if they're in a bad place and they want to, you know, start to heal a little bit and move out of the darkness? What would you say to them? Foundationally, um, the ideology that you're still here. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, all of us believe in something, whether it be God or whether it be Yahoo, whoever whoever mm -hmm. you want to believe in, you're still here. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion, and it's helped me through a great deal, is the fact that, that I know he had his plans with, with the maker, whatever you want to call the maker. And if I'm still here, guess what that means? Mm -hmm. that, that I still have plans. Mm -hmm. And those plans might be unknown. Um, for me, I always said that, that there was a mission that I was to go on. I was to live out Jonathan's legacy because he helped out so many children that were born after him with the same medical mm -hmm. condition that will now go on to live longer, and he never got to meet them, or he, he mm -hmm. never, he'd never never be able to meet them or know them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna live out his legacy. But get back to the foundational question, is realize mm -hmm. that you're still here. Yeah. Um, that, that person you lost, that lost loved one, if they are looking down at you, they don't wanna see you go and sit in the front yard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wanna mm -hmm. see you move forward. One of my phrases is, honor your loved one's life by living yours. Mm -hmm. Love it, that's We good. forget how precious life is. I know, and, and yeah. I've had a discussion recently with somebody, and it's so odd that it takes us for us to realize how precious our life really and is short. day by day. And then, then I, I forget it until the next time something comes up to remind me that life is short and precious again. Mm -hmm. Heidi, are you going to let the sibling thing drop completely? Do you have anything <laughs> more you want to say about it? I love that Ron <clears throat> said all this because we are the forgotten ones, as this Ron said, and we are our losses minimized, and the idea that you have surviving children because, you know, we are counting the number of pictures in the house. Absolutely. And we are seeing that Scott has got 40 pictures and I have one. You know? <laughs> That's true. And, and we are wondering if we're enough for our parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we enough to keep them alive? Are we enough that they will have joy in their lives again? 
And when they are in bad places, we don't think we are enough. Yeah. Right. So I love the idea, like you both have said, to live your life as a tribute and and with joy and to live your best life and to remember that the surviving children, I'm always saying when we do toasts, if you do a toast at Thanksgiving or during the holidays, say, hey, this is a toast to Michael and Jonathan and and to Scott, but this is also a toast to all those that I love that are still here. And let's say their names and celebrate them as well. Yes. Absolutely. So bringing everybody, Absolutely. not just those that we've loved that are no longer physically with us. Mm -hmm. And they, we, we know they're still with us. One thing I did ways. for my whole family was about eight years in, Yeah. I said, you know what? Michael didn't die every year, July 22nd. He died one July 22nd. That's right, I like that. was that. eight years ago. <laughs> what are we doing, good. you know? So then I said to my kids, I said, we're gonna have uh, Michael's day, a celebration of joy. We're gonna talk about Mike and make it fun, like he's here, just part of us. And I got I pizzas, it. and I got everything. And you know, of course, my younger daughter's a right. She, she thought I was a little nuts, but <laughs> she goes along with me. Yeah. So, so we got everybody together, and we did that. From that point, I saw an upswing, because it kind of broke the, I said, we're not grieving, we're not meeting every year, poor Mike, poor that. No, that was eight, 10, whatever years ago. Mm -hmm. We're gonna celebrate his life, because he never left. If somebody went into the military today, mm -hmm. someone, someone into the military for a year, they don't see each other, they're still loving each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you communicate in many different ways, you know? Yeah. So we did that, and it was very, very helpful, even I, till today. I love what you're saying. Yeah. That, that Michael didn't die every July 22nd. No. He died one time July 22nd. Yes. Because we do, we have these anniversary dates where every year on that day we have to grieve mm -hmm. yes. really hard and we go, it brings us right back to that moment in time. We relive so, that day. Now, I don't want to give yeah. a message out to people who are married that every time the anniversary day comes, and I'm telling them, <laughs> I don't want no women getting to me. So I'm telling them, celebrate that day. <laughs> but, but, you know, when you really think about it, right? I mean, the person never is in dying yeah. every, every year. Exactly. And, and, not, and every time that you do that, it's just like I see like 9-11. Yeah. Every year they, they play yeah. that. Yeah. And you watch that. And I said to people, I said, you know, in all fairness, that's once a year and they have to relive this thing. Right. And read all their names. But and mm -hmm. me, yeah. as a parent whose son was killed in, by a tractor trailer, mm -hmm. I have to see kids and people dying in crashes on the front cover of newspapers. That's right. All the time. That and a lot true. of these people start triggering back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. They yeah. Start, so they're getting so. all this back all the time. I contacted newspapers and said, I have a great story like he does. Mm -hmm. Why don't you do a story mm -hmm. on me, a full page, yeah. to let people know that there's life beyond the death. That's right. Something joyful. Yep. Never would do it. Newsday wouldn't mm -hmm. do it. No newspaper That's would, what would I do find it. fascinating. People like to know the way they die, but not the way that we've nope. gone on to live and celebrate nope. and find joy. Yes. Yep. And you guys certainly have. But what you're doing, you two guys are doing, um, is what's needed. Mm -hmm. But the media still believes in the news that's negative is going to sell. Right. Not believe, necessarily. Right. They right. want to hear this yeah. out there. They want to see this. But if you notice, there's a lot of you know broadcasters on radio and stuff like that yeah. that say things that really are colorful or yeah. whatever, have no meaning, yeah. but they have millions of view listeners and viewers. Right. Now, why is that? Right. Because the big machine said, well, people are listening. Yeah. I'm telling you, there are more people would listen to this yeah. if this was on mainstream then they would want to listen to this negativity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I we agree. started public access, and thank goodness yeah. for public access, because it gave us the opportunity to bring our message out. On TV, we were doing radio for 10 years. Yeah, okay. and these yeah. cable shows for five. Well, can, yeah. I, can I make it about you for one second? <laughs> I'm, I'm Hi, totally, is this a Men in Grief show? I'm totally we'll make it a Women in Grief show. Hi, here we are. All the work you two, you two do, and I was even telling Karen that in the car, I'm amazed at the work you do you're not getting, you don't get paid for it. Your only motive is, is to spread the word because of the loss you've had and my, maybe spread some joy to other people. Right. And I'm amazed. I don't do this much of what you guys well, do. So I'm just telling you. it's what I needed you. after Scott died and didn't have. And I yeah. want, we love to have a platform for people like you all that are here, mm -hmm. Anna included, because you lost your, your parents, right? Mm -hmm. So all of us are coming from a place of loss, but we're all here to say you can have joy. If you've lost hope, please lean on ours and let your life be your message. Good. Anna, we want to talk a little bit about what you'll be singing today and why you yeah. write your song. Yes. So, yep, p people commission me for all kinds of different things to do songs, and the one I'm going to be playing today that you mentioned called Bright Eyes is a father who contracted Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, which, as you know, sort of so slowly makes all of the muscles stop working. And he reached out to me and said, I'd like a song for my daughter. I'd like to be able to leave it behind for her, but I'd also like before I pass on to be able to share it with her. Mm -hmm. So we did this interview 
he couldn't use his hands anymore. He, couldn't, he lived far away and he couldn't type, so he used his eye to poke out each, to point to uh, each letter on a screen uh -huh. to answer the questions that I asked him about what is it you want to communicate. You know, think about it for a minute. If you know your time is very limited uh -huh. and you're trying to communicate with the child, if either of you, if your son had been able to say, I know I'm leaving and here's what I want you to right. know, that's Amen. what this song yeah offered up oh, and gosh. I thought he would want to, to compose a song about death and loss and he did not. He wanted to create a song about what it felt like when, when I was healthy and able to really be present with you because I want you to always mm, remember um, what that. that felt like and that's what this song celebrates. That Wonderful. Is, and I, I shared it with them, they shared it with each other, the ALS Association made it a song on their website wow. and then I did play it at his funeral as well, which was wow. a hard I would think. Wow. thing to yeah, do. I would think. You were really ready to go right down with the whole thing. Good for you. Yeah. Because a lot of people aren't ready to go right to the high thing. That's why it's hard because people mm -hmm. just really aren't ready. Yeah. Well I want to really thank you guys for being on the show. I'm honored. And thank you for yes, having us. It's yes, really thank been you. fun. Could you give us one piece of advice? You can start Ron for men, say the first year and maybe what got you through? What was the most helpful? I would say uh, allow yourself to go through it. Allow yourself to feel the pain. However, I'm a very big, big believer in journaling. So when you journal, it's the only time you could actually see what you're thinking and put it on paper. If it looks sloppy, if it's wet from tears, it doesn't matter. Journal, and the more you write, the more you're taking this stuff out of your subconscious mm -hmm. and you're gonna take the old stuff out However, replace it with some new books, I like new that. different stuff. And it doesn't have to be about grieving. You know, mm -hmm. books that, that have nothing to do with grieving, just new stuff and fill your thought library up with some new stuff. But you need to write to get empty out the thought fill library. Fill your thought library. And you know, there's been a lot of research that supports what you're saying, and you probably okay. already know that. That it does, it purges when we write. It purges it, it gets it out of our system. Absolutely. Grief gets trapped in the body. Yep. I like this, Ron. Yeah. It does get trapped in the body. Yeah. Um, if I were to give advice to anybody, first year especially, is two key words, awareness and understanding. Um, try to be aware of not only what you're going through, but what your partner might be going through too. And it doesn't have to be a, a mother and father that mm -hmm. might have lost a child. It could be a, a mother-son dynamic or a father-daughter dynamic mm -hmm. or just, just friends and partners out there. But realize that we're all going to go through grief, you know this, differently. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say that... Uh, you know, as long as you're not harming yourself or others, uh, you know, drinking more alcohol or, or getting into recreational drugs, that, that what you're going through is, is okay. It's who you are. Seek help, uh, especially if you start going down that road. But to understand more about you, which has really got me to, 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 to move forward where I was before, I started to understand and I started to become aware. And once I started doing that, everything changed. Mm -hmm. So especially when you're looking into relationships, if, if I start to realize how you are, then, then, then I start to understand why you are the way that you are. And hopefully you figured out how I am. <laughs> but anyway, thank you all That's for awesome. being on the That's show. That's great oh, advice. Thank you, thank great you so advice. much. Yeah, Thanks you. for watching the show today. And well, Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you lose hope, please lean on ours till you find your own. And God bless. Watching you laughing and find myself laughing and strong for you. Wasting, it was like nothing to 
lift you to the sky. It was like everything to see me through your bright, bright eyes. But my courage does not halt or falter now. I will love you my last breath of air God does not give us the burdens we deserve but the ones we can bear so watch for me Eternally feel for me in the passing breeze. One day I'll be sailing free right beside you.